Bye. Thanks so much. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, we're going to be talking about some tips for lean user research. Um, this shouldn't take more than half an hour or so, and then there are going to be time, there's going to be time for questions afterwards. Um, I always like to start things off by just making sure that everybody's in the right webinar. So let's take a quick look at who this is for. Specifically, this talk is for people who make stuff for a living. Um, it doesn't assume that you know anything at all about user research, you know, beyond the fact that you're supposed to do it. Um, if you've tried learning things from users before, or you've been at a company where it's been done, or you know, you've, you've done research yourself, that's totally fine. I'm not going to make you leave. Um, but you'll notice that professional researcher is not on this list. And this, this talk isn't really for them. Uh, if you do research for a living, you should already know all of this, because we're going to talk about some really important, really basic stuff. Um, if you're already getting out of the building and talking to people, that's fantastic. This talk should make you better at doing that. And it'll, start, it'll get you to start thinking about the right questions uh, before you start asking them of people. So I'm going to require a little bit of work from you guys today. Um, I'm going to have you writing a few things down. doing a few activities. So it might be a good idea to get a pen and paper ready or set things up so you can take notes on your computer. Instead of just, you know, drifting off to the not so soothing sounds of my voice, I want you to think actively about whatever product you're actually currently working on. And when you leave, I want you to be able to immediately go out and start using what we talk about here today. Let's jump right into our tips. So this first tip, know what you're testing. Okay, I get it. it seems a little bit obvious. I mean, before you go test something, you should know what it is, but stick with me, it's gonna make sense in a few minutes. The first thing that I'd like you to do, here's our first exercise. Um, I want you to write down the most important thing that you wanna learn about your product or market right now. This is the thing that you might try to run some sort of experiment or conduct some sort of research to learn. Basically, if you were going to run some sort of user research tomorrow and learn something, I wanna know what that would be. Don't think about it too hard. You're only going to get about 20 more seconds to do it. So um, I'll be quiet for about 20 seconds and let you write this down. Okay, that was about 20 seconds. You got it? If not, we're moving on anyway. Don't worry, I think you can download these slides later so you'll have access to all of the activities. They're, they're very short. So, I'd like you to look at the thing you're trying to learn, and I'd like you to ask yourself these two questions about it. I want you to ask if it's a why question or a what question. What questions are things like, what step of registration are my users getting stuck on? Why questions are things like, why are users getting stuck on step three of registration? So, you can see the difference. Another thing to look at is whether you're learning about your user or about your product. So a user question is something like, how do people you know, who use my product, how, how do um, people in the persona group that I care about currently shop for groceries? And obviously this would only matter if you were doing a product that you know, had something to do with groceries. Um, a product question is something like, can users find a particular type of grocery item using my product? So why on earth would you care about whether you're looking at why or what or user or product? The reason that this is important is that what questions can often be answered using quantitative measurement techniques, while why questions should generally be answered with qualitative research. You got that? So what is quantitative and why is qualitative? Similarly, user questions can often be used with ethnographic methods. That's where you actually go out and watch people's natural behavior, while product questions are often easier to answer using usability research. That's the kind you may be familiar with where you give people specific tasks to perform, you know, using your product or somebody else's product. So again, user, user questions, ethnography, learning about the user, product questions, usability, learning about the product. The thing that I see all the time is people thinking that there's only one kind of research that they need to do, that you know, they just do customer development interviews or usability tests, and that's the sum total of research, but that's really not true. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time today to go into the dozens of different types of testing that you could do, quantitative, qualitative, but once you know what you're looking for, you can do a deeper dive into how to conduct specific types of research and how to set up the different tests. 
Also, um, just so you know, I'm going to give you my email at the end of this talk, and you can always write and ask me specific questions. I really do respond to all emails about stuff like this, you know, eventually. So let's talk about tip number two. Okay, this one, I'll admit, also seems a little bit obvious, um, but you'd be surprised how many people get this wrong. We get told to get out of the building a lot, but we're not always told where we should go, or we get told to talk to customers, but you know, what if you don't have customers, or what if your customers are hard to get a hold of, or what if you've talked to both of them already? So what I want you to do is another quick exercise. Um, I'd like you to take, again, 20, 30 seconds, and I'd like you to write down a very quick, just few words, a description of the person you're building the product for. I don't want their age or how many pets they have, unless that's somehow relevant to your product, because it's for you know old people with cats or whatever. Um, I want a description of what sort of person would use your product, stated in a way that makes it clear why they would use your product. I know it might seem a little bit confusing, but just take a minute, give it a shot. We'll get to specifics in a second. Another 20 seconds on the clock. Okay, everybody got something written down? I hope so, because we are moving on. Okay, here's your first question. Did you write that you're your own user? Wrong, you're not. I mean, you might be one of your users, but unless you are literally building a product aimed at first-time startup founders of angel-funded companies with fewer than five people or you know whatever particular exact description fits you, you are not your target market. I mean, even if that is your market, you still know way too much about your own product to be a valid tester and to be a valid persona. So you can't, you, say it with me, you are not your user. Trust me on this. Here are some other things that, that people say when I ask them who their persona is or who their user is. Um, they say things like moms. But you know what, moms aren't a valid persona. Let me explain why. So I want you to think of five moms that you know. Like maybe you have one, for example, or maybe you are one, maybe you're married to one, you went to high school with one, you know, you met one at the grocery store the other day. Um, they're all quite different, aren't they? When you really think about the different moms that you know. For example, a single mother of three who's working two jobs and lives in the city really can't be in the same persona group as a stay-at-home mom of one who lives in the suburbs. They might both have kids, but they probably have different problems. And trying to build something to make them both happy is really, really, really hard, at least at first. Remember, even Facebook started off as just Harvard students. Other examples, you know, pet owners, doctors, salespeople, these are also not markets. They're just too broad, and they don't have anything behaviorally similar about them. Here's a little bit better example. Let's read that together. The person using my product owns more than one electronic device on which she has tried to view documents for work. She finds this difficult and frustrating. Note that for this particular product, I don't mention things like how many kids she has or where she lives. That's because for this particular product, you know, whatever it might be, might be, I don't know, Dropbox, um, those things aren't relevant. What's relevant is that this is a person with multiple electronic devices, all of which are used to perform work, and that the work involves some sort of documents. I also noted that this is a problem since, you know, Dropbox wouldn't be as popular as it is if the particular task had been super easy for everybody. Of course, once you have a description of the people that you're interested in talking to, you have to go find them. And I get asked for suggestions on this a lot. Um, these are some of my favorite places to recruit research participants. Um, one thing that I'll do is I'll often create a short qualifying survey called a screener. You can look up a user research screener on Google and just find um, good examples and blog posts of how to write a good screener. Um, and I, I post that screener on the web using something like SurveyMonkey. Then I'll drive traffic to it by emailing friends or posting to Twitter or commenting on blogs or forums, um, sometimes using you know, things like AdWords. Um, in some cases, I actually recommend that founders build an email list or a blog first before ever building a product, since this allows them to start gathering an audience that can then be mined for user research. I mean, you have to build your user base anyway, so you might as well get as much of it done before you build your product, right? Um, and the great thing is that if you've built that user base, you can then, um, 
you can then reach out to them and talk to them and understand more about why they signed up for your product and why they might be interested. But why does it matter who you research with? I mean, why can't you just go to Starbucks and show off your awesome prototype and see what people think? Well, if you just want to do some simple usability testing, for example, maybe you want to know if a normal person could get through your registration flow, then guerrilla usability testing at Starbucks is a fine way to go. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But if you're trying to understand the person you're building the product for, or you're trying to learn what problems people might pay you to solve, you really have to go to the source. You can't find out if your product for astrophysicists is going to be useful by talking to some folks at Starbucks. I mean, unless a Starbucks happens to be right next door to NASA, in which case you might have a shot. But, you know, you should really recruit directly from NASA. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this all sounds so hard. That's, that's always what people are thinking every time I start talking about research. But it all sounds so hard. Isn't there something we can do to make it a little faster or cheaper? So I'm going to teach you a couple of tricks. Um, but I want to say right now that these cannot be the only types of tests you run. Sometimes you just have to buckle down and really have in-depth conversations with real people in your persona group in order to truly understand their lives and problems, as hard as that may sound. It's really important that you have to do it sometimes. But sometimes, you know, you can cheat a little bit. But first, I'm going to make you do even more work. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that everybody's still awake since I can't hear any of you. Um, this time, I want you to take... 20 seconds again, and I want you to write down different types of user research that you could do in under an hour, as many as you can think of. This is an hour of your time. Um, a few of the ones that I mentioned are going to take well under an hour to set up, although they might have to be left alone once you get them started. Okay, go. Okay, I gave you 22 seconds that time, because I'm nice. Did you get any of these? Because you can start a research session with any of these in under an hour. Of course, for some of them, you're going to, like I said, you'll need to wait a little bit to get results back. Um, but that's time you can spend doing other things. So, you know, why not take an hour out of your day and start a remote, unmoderated usability session on a new feature that, you know, or a badly performing registration flow? To be clear, I don't know why I always pick on registration flows, but in my experience, 90% of the time, they're terrible. Um, the other thing you can do, you know, if you don't have a product, you can do a remote usability test on somebody else's product, maybe on a competitor, see what they're screwing up. I love that one. That one's great. Um, don't make the same mistakes everybody else is making. Make your own new brilliant mistakes. Um, this last one is really interesting because you can often run the whole thing in under an hour. I mean, it seems like customer development, like I said, you know, it's always got to be super hard, but you can have one customer development call in under an hour. If you, you have to have some access to current customers but it takes under an hour to send an email, set up a time, and then have a conversation, you know, or do a screen share with a current customer. In fact, it's really nice to have a roster of real customers who are willing to jump on a go-to meeting or a WebEx and take a look at a new feature or, you know, give feedback on a wireframe. Did you know that you can also get feedback in 15 minutes? I mean, now you guys really have literally no excuse for not doing research. All right, you, you cannot tell me that you don't have time for research. I will not buy it. Now, granted, the types of feedback you can get here are severely restricted. You're not going to do great customer development in this amount of time. But you can really get good usability information. Um, one of my favorite less well-known ways to get feedback is called the five-second test. And there's actually a website called Five Second Test with which I have no affiliation, but I talk about it all the time because I love it. Um, but you can actually also do a five-second test in person really easily. So if you're using the site, you upload a mock-up or a picture of a landing page and you write a few questions um, that you'd like people to answer. And then people who come to the site are shown your landing page for five seconds, and then it goes away, and then they have to answer your questions about it. And I like to ask questions like, you know, what does this product do? Who is this product for? Um, you know, what, what, is, what is the point of this thing? And the reason that this is so powerful is that it tells you what complete strangers think your product does in a basically the amount of time that it would take for them to, you know, come look at your landing page and then probably leave. Um, try it a few times and you're going to be surprised at how often the messaging on your landing page is completely failing to convey that particular piece of information about, you know, what you actually do. Um, it's just the best way to figure out why your messaging is failing and it can provide 
wonderful clues about why people aren't converting and it takes literally seconds. So you'll notice that a lot of the research that we, I talked about here, as I mentioned, is some variation on usability testing. And you know, you'll get a lot of feedback on whether people can easily perform some task or other in your product. Um, it is, like I said, it's hard to cut corners on real customer development or understanding your market. But you know, this usability stuff, this is still really, really important. I mean, learning that your registration flow is, is incredibly confusing is the first step to building a registration flow that is not incredibly confusing. I'm always shocked at how many startups don't even do the small amount of work required to make sure that people can use their products. You know what's worse than not doing user research? Doing it and then not doing anything with the results. Okay, so this is bad. You, you'd think that it, it wasn't as bad, but it is. It, it's actually worse because then you've sunk time and money into something that you completely ignore. And sometimes this happens not because people, you know, willfully want to ignore results or, you know, they, they hate things that are good. But it happens because people have absolutely no idea what to do with all this data that they collect. They're just like, oh, look, I've got all this great information. Neat. So let's, um, let's look at a way to fix that. But first, yes, there is another thought exercise. Um, very quickly, 20 seconds again, I, give, I want you to write down what you typically do in the five minutes after you've talked to a user or potential user. Okay, 20 seconds, go. You ready? All right, let's do this. Okay, let's say you've just ended a research session. You talk to somebody for 30 minutes about your product or your mock-up. Hopefully you've had more than one person in the room with you. Trust me, these things go better if you have at least one person to lead the conversation, that's the moderator, and one person to take notes. And feel free to add a third if it doesn't make the participant uncomfortable or if you're doing it remotely. I mean, if you're doing it remotely, you can have as many people as you want. So I want you to take a stack of sticky notes and I want you to divvy them up. And I want you to spend a few minutes writing down five key observations or problems that each person saw. And I want you to do it independently. Everybody gets their own stack of sticky notes. You do it quietly. This isn't a group think exercise. You're not all trying to come up with, you know, exactly five. You're each trying to come up with five. Part of the point of this actually is to make sure that everybody on the team is hearing the same thing. You'll be surprised at how often that doesn't happen. You, you do that better by writing down your observations independently and then comparing them later. Okay, the next step, I want you to um, put all of your post-its together and I want you to dedupe them, you know, get rid of all the duplicates. And I want you to think of all these observations as potential fixes or features and ask yourself, what metric would change if I changed, the, if, I, if I made this change? For example, let's imagine that you noticed people had trouble finding the next button on what? Yes, the registration flow. If you were to fix that, somehow, presumably, your registration metric would improve. On the other hand, Let's imagine that you're noticing that people who have used your product for a while tend to stop coming back after week three. If you were to figure out why that was happening through your research and fix that, it would presumably improve your retention metric, right? So, every, so one person always asks this, what happens if you notice something that won't materially change an important metric? I mean, it won't make you more money, it won't get people to come back to your site more often, or, or visitors, it won't turn visitors into regular members. Well, you know, like how do, how do I sort that into a metric? Well, my question to you is, why would you wanna make a change that's not going to improve a key metric? The whole point of this is to make your product better in ways that are important to your business. So try to sort everything into key metrics. And, and it, honestly, it's up to you to define how your key metrics are set up. I'm not gonna cover that in this talk, but I wanna take this time to plug the book Lean Analytics, which is also by O'Reilly and is fantastic. It'll help you figure out all about what metrics are important. Um, and the important thing is that you sort all of your changes or changes or feature ideas or bug fixes into the metric that you think they will affect most. I know it sounds a little confusing, but it's really much easier than you think once you started doing it with your own data. Okay, now that you've got everything sorted by metric, within each metric, I want you to stack rank each column. I want you to try to figure out the highest priority things to change first. Okay, I admit this is gonna to be totally subjective, but you're looking for things with the highest return on investment. 
this is actually the hardest part for me. Um, it's tough to estimate whether, you know, fixing that next button on registration is going to make a bigger difference than adding a brand new feature that encourages more people to register. But the thing is, you're going to get this wrong at first. I mean, you just will. Um, but if you continue to go through this process and you measure your actual outcomes and you compare them to what you thought, you're going to get better at it over time. This is the kind of thing that really improves with practice. You're never going to be perfect at estimating ROI, but I'll tell you right now, the people who do this over and over get better at it quickly. And it's one of the reasons that you keep these sticky notes around for a long time so that you can actually measure what happened and what you predict against what you predicted to happen. That's the only way to improve your predictions. And I'm going to be honest, this is not the exact model that you have to follow. Um, there are other ways of gathering data and dealing with it. Um, but there are important parts of the model, and those are to, one, debrief after each time you run an experiment or talk to a user. Don't just go through, you know, session after session after session. You're going to totally forget what happened in the first one after the, the tenth one. Um, trust me on this. I've done that. Um, two, capture the information in some sort of persistent way. Like I said, it's really important that it, that it keeps going. Three, determine which are the most important things to act on according to whatever metrics you care about. And four, actually act on them. Remember, it doesn't do you any good to do user research if you're not benefiting from it. So why do you bother with any of this? Well, by having some sort of standard way of dealing with information after you run any sort of test, whether it's customer development interview, a usability test, an A-B test, um, you're going to be more likely to then understand the big picture. You're going to be able to see which things come up over and over again in research. And this is important because sometimes it's really easy to listen to the loudest person or the latest person rather than, you know, hearing things that were said quietly by lots of people or, or to notice patterns. Um, you're going to be able to make connections between quantitative and qualitative research more easily if you've got that persistent data. For example, you know, if you've done an A-B test and learned that one registration flow is better than the other, that's going to make even more sense once you've run some usability tests on both branches of your A-B test in order to learn why, you know, A or B won. Having persistent visual data from your tests also helps you communicate the results to people in the company, which is really important when you're trying to build consensus around what changes you're going to make. Okay, this is the last one. I told you that this wouldn't take too long. Um, but this is perhaps the most important one. I want you to know the unanswerable questions. I'm getting very zen on this one. Um, if you've ever talked to a user or a potential user, I almost guarantee you that you've asked one of these questions. I mean, I've asked some of them, and I'm not proud of it, but I've done it. Um, but we have to stop doing it. And the reason is that there are questions that people simply can't answer. Your last exercise of the day, I mean, unless you choose to exercise on your own later, I want you to write down a question that you've asked to a user that they could not answer. Once again, 20 seconds, go. Okay, I hope you've thought of your question. Was it any of these? Wait, what's that? You've asked these questions and people have answered them? Right, they lied. I mean, they didn't lie on purpose. They weren't being malicious. They, weren't, they were probably trying to be helpful, in fact. But the problem is that a user or a potential user cannot answer any of these questions correctly. Um, you're asking them to tell the future or to design your product for you, and neither of those things are, are things that people are likely to be able to do. Um, I'm going to give you my weird little example that I always give. Uh, let's say that I were to ask you, are you going to eat a cookie tomorrow? I mean, it seems simple enough. You, you don't, you know, you're either going to eat a cookie tomorrow or not. Like, just decide, are you going to eat a cookie tomorrow? But see, you don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow. Maybe you eat a cookie every day for lunch, so you think it's pretty safe to say yes. But, you know, what if you're sick tomorrow and you can't leave the house? Or, or maybe you drop the cookie before you get a chance to eat it. You don't really know what's going to happen. In fact, just because I've mentioned cookies today, they subconsciously make you more likely to want a cookie. I know I want a cookie right now. Um, I've put cookies into your head and now you're thinking about them. I may in fact have convinced you to eat a cookie that you would not otherwise have eaten, which if you're talking about your product, it turns out that's not user research, that's sales. And it's dangerous if you're trying to figure out if people left on their own would buy your product, which is apparently a cookie. 
the design questions are even worse, right? You're literally asking people to do your job for you. I mean, this is a product you work on every day. You think about it constantly. You built it from nothing. Why are you suddenly going to turn over design decisions to somebody who agreed to talk to you for 45 minutes and who might use your product once a week? I mean, that's insanity. You got to do your job. So what do you ask instead? Because I understand why people ask those unanswerable questions. Those are really important questions. You need to know those things. But you're better off spending your limited time talking to people about their problems and asking them about their current or past behavior. People will tell you the truth about their current or past behavior, behavior generally. Um, ask them whether they've looked for or bought similar products in the past. past. Ask why they aren't using those products any longer. Or if they're still using them, ask what they love about them. Um, or what they hate about them. Ask them how they found those similar products, since that sort of thing might help you understand your distribution channels, um, might help you understand how your customers discover new things. Um, ask them to tell you exactly what happened the last time they used your product, and note all the things that they said were hard, or that they had to you know, use some other product to accomplish. Or even better yet, ask them to show you exactly what happened the last time they used your product. That's how to ask those unanswerable questions in a totally answerable way. Okay, so hopefully I've made it fairly clear why you should care about these questions and why you should never, ever ask them. Um, but I want to point out one more reason why these questions are poisonous. These questions make you feel like you know something. If somebody says that they're going to pay you $20 a month for your product, you're going to feel like you know people will pay you $20 a month for your product, but you don't. You won't know people will pay you until they've handed you their credit cards or they've signed a legally binding document or they've handed you a $20 bill. So that's actually it for the talk part. Um, I want to take questions from the audience now. Um, just so you know, I'd like to keep the questions focused on lean user research, but if you have questions about other aspects of Lean UX, or if you want to ask really specific questions about your particular product or company, please feel free to send me an email at laura at usersknow.com. Like I said, I really do answer all of those emails. Um, not immediately, but you know, within a few days generally. Um, if you'd like further information on topics like these, I'd like you to follow me on Twitter at Laura Klein. Um, and if you enjoyed this talk, please, please, please don't forget to buy my book, UX for Lean Startups. There's lots more stuff like this about user research. There's also stuff about design and about testing. Um, read my blog at Users Know. Or if you like the workshop format, you can take one of my workshops that are going to be offered soon um, at Luxor. That's at L-U-X-R. You can find more about them um, at Luxor.co. And I believe I have another webcast coming up in a couple of months, and that one will be a Q&A with Eric Reese, who is awesome. But uh, thanks again. So who's got a question? Perfect, Laura. Thank you so much. We have lots of questions that have come in from the audience. And folks, if you're just joining us now, maybe heard a little bit late here of the presentation, open the group chat, type in your questions that you have for Laura. We'll take as many as we have time for. Okay, we have a question from Ben. Is there a page or site you recommend with a list of different testing types? Oh, oh, I wish there were. And if I would get off my butt, then it would be my blog. Um, I am trying to put that together. Um, I do not have anything to offer you right now. Um, I'm going to have a list of them in one of my classes that's going to be offered, at, like I said, at Luxor.co. Uh, that's um, not available yet, but it will be next week. Um, if you send me an email with, you know, a description of the, the thing that you're that you're trying to learn, I can respond back with the the correct type of research that you would want to to learn. Um, there are also a, I mean, the thing about user research is that it's not a new field. I mean, I know that I talk a lot about lean user research, but um, the truth is that, you know, user research itself has been around forever and, you know, things like contextual inquiry and usability testing, um, ethnography and observational testing, these are all really well understood problems. So if you get a book on user research, uh, those will probably cover, you know, most of the, the standard ones will probably cover most of these different types of testing. I don't have a good suggestion because, of course, I learned how to do most of them about 15 years ago and I've forgotten which books I read. So sorry about that. Thank you very much. We have another question here. This comes from Ida. Uh, any suggestions for different ways to test for B2B applications or products? Our customers are automobile dealers. Hard to get their time and not a consumer at large. Um, 
Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to really split out the kinds of research that you need to that, where you really desperately need to use people solidly in your persona group from the types of research where you can get away with using people who are just similar to that. So um, let me give you a little example. Like I said before, usability testing, you don't always need to use people who are exactly in your persona group um, for certain types of usability testing. So if you can get away with using people who, who aren't perfect, uh, you, need to, you can do that. Um, if you're talking about recruiting people in recruiting auto dealers, um, one thing that you can do actually is you can go to a professional recruiter. There are people who recruit user research participants for a living. So for the, the participants who are very, very, very hard to find um, or who are very hard to get a hold of, um, if you can get your first few through a professional recruiter, um, it'll cost you somewhere between 100 to 200 bucks a head to get them, but I mean, that's fine. You can probably take that much of your time anyway to find these people. If you find the first few through them, never underestimate the power of the network effect, right? Like after you interview those people, ask them about, ask them who they know who would also be interested in, in talking to you. Um, often if you're offering an incentive, and I do, um, I do offer incentives when I do certain types of user research, you know, I'll offer $100, $150 an hour for somebody to, to talk to me for an hour um, just because I, I have to do that to compensate them for their time in certain, in certain cases. I don't always do that, but in certain cases, like, you'll probably have to offer them an incentive. Um, so, you know, if you're offering them an incentive, you're giving that to them. As you're handing them the incentive, say, you know, do you know any other people who are just like you that, that I could talk to um, that would, you know, that could help me out with this research? And they'll generally help you out, you know, because it turns out that people know other people like them. Um, but like I said, you might need to find your first, through, first few through a, a professional research um, uh, recruiter. And a lot of people don't even know that these guys exist, um, but they're, they're actually really quite useful. They have giant databases of people who are willing to talk. Thank you so much. Next question here is from John. He says, less than one hour assumes the product is already existing and ready. What about tips for testing a potentially new product? Um, so, yeah, um, that's a good question. Like I said, the, the under an hour ones tend to be usability uh, tests, so they do presume some level of product. Now, that could be an interactive prototype. It doesn't have to be a working product. It could be an interactive prototype. It could be a product that's, you know, it could be a piece of a product that maybe, you know, you've got part of the front end developed and, you know, you just want to do some quick usability testing on, on that. Um, you know, that you haven't actually, you're not comfortable releasing the whole thing yet. So don't forget that. You don't have to have the whole thing built to do usability testing on some of that. Um, the five second tests and the landing page tests, actually, um, you can do with nothing. I mean, you can do that with just mock-ups. You're just really at that point, you're, you're testing your messaging and you're testing your value proposition. Um, other things that are very quick that you can do, um, on the same, so the same people who do five second tests do something called click test where you can um, hook up mock-ups together and um, ask people, you know, like where would you click next? To, you know, you give them a, a task to perform basically and ask them to click on things. But when we're talking about trying to figure out if your idea is any good, right? You're trying to figure out if you have a good product idea before you're building your product. Those tend to be, honestly, the more time intensive types of research. I do, I mean, I do research throughout the life of the product, but I do a lot more research before I've got a product than I do, you know, after I've already got something out there. Um, research gets much easier once you have something out there, but um, you cannot cut corners, you cannot skimp on the just going out understanding people, looking for problems. Um, one thing that will make things go faster, actually, let me give you a quick tip that, um, that will make things go much, much, much faster in your customer development. Make sure that you have a really solid idea of a persona, like we talked about before, that who are you, you building for, before you start talking to people. And make sure that the people you're talking to fit that persona. Don't talk to people outside of that persona. And if you're not seeing patterns, 
If you're not hearing similar things from all of those people, fix the persona. The reason why I say this is I see tons of people who go out and they talk to, I am not making this up, hundreds and hundreds of people. And they try to, and they're all sorts of different people. You know, they're talking to VCs or they're talking to their mom or they're talking to their uncle or they're talking to their friends or they're talking to, you know, people who own car dealerships or who don't own car dealerships. And they're trying to get information from this really wide, different group of people. But the problem is that you're going to waste a tremendous amount of time because, like, let's say that you do have a, a, a product that you want to build and it's, you know, around cars, right? And you think, okay, um, this is a product for people um, who are, you know, brunette women, <laughs> right? It's stupid for some of it. Like, I'm going to make a product that's going to be for brunette women. And um, I'm going to go out and I'm just going to talk to brunette women. Um, but the problem is, right, that then you could talk to, like, me or you could talk to Danica Patrick or you could talk to my mom. And I guarantee you that if you talk to my mom and me and Danica Patrick, who, you know, of course, drives race cars, um, you're going to get really different opinions about what we're looking for in a car, right? Like, I'm looking for a car that's going to drive itself. And, you know, my mom's going to look for a car that, um, you know, you can't, like, the it's all of her dogs and you know Danica Patrick is looking for one that has you know more space for I don't know promotions but you know or something that's really fast so you have to make sure that you're talking to the right group of people and if you're talking to if everybody that you're talking to is very similar you're going to start to see patterns much faster so you will have to talk to fewer people which will save you a huge amount of time but you still have to take the time and talk to those people and um, that's what you can't cut corners on excellent thank question. you very much Laura Couple more questions here, folks. Keep keep them coming. Um, let's see. We'll take this one from Darwin. How do you answer questions about ROI for user research? I've had issues getting user research products approved because of a misunderstanding of the value of the research. Yes, <laughs> this is this is a tricky one. Um, one of the ways. So there are a couple of of, of things that you can do here. Um, if you are tracking what comes out of the user research, that's going to help you tremendously. And the, the reason that I say that is that um, there is no ROI just on research, if that makes any sense. The ROI comes from the insights and the changes that you recommend coming out of the research. I know that that sounds really obvious, but um, people sort of tend to think like, no, 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 user research is really good for the product. Well, user research isn't really good for the product. The, in, the stuff that comes out of user research is fantastic for the product. So what you need to do is if you, you know, you can get one of these approved, um, that's, that is always a trick, um, you, you then take, you then track the results that came out of it. Like I said, you have some persistent visual way of saying, um, these are the things that we're recommending that we do. And then you have to actually follow through and track, okay, and then we did this, and what we saw was, you know, you have to actually be in an environment where you can test um, what happens when you release something new. I know not everybody's in that environment. It's really tough. Um, in that case, if you don't have, you know, metrics where you can say, look, we changed this, it improved revenue by 10%, right? If you don't have that feedback loop, it gets much harder. But what you can do is you can then run another user research session and say, you know, before this, we saw these problems and we saw everybody had these problems. And then we ran the same research again after we fixed, we made these fixes and we didn't see these problems. So clearly we're improving the user research, or I'm sorry, we're, we're improving the, the user experience. Um, but you know, the, the best way to do it is to be in an environment where you can actually close that feedback loop with actual metrics. Um, the other thing that I'm going to suggest, because um, I get this question a lot, and I'm going to go a little bit off topic here, but I get this question a lot from people who what they're really saying is, um, people in my company don't believe in user research, and they don't think it's important. <laughs> and I think that often those people are not involved in the user research. Um, Tomer Sharon has some really interesting stuff uh, that he talks about. He's a user researcher at Google, and he talks about the fact that, you know, you need to get everybody involved in the research, and I 100% agree. If you've got those product managers, you know, who are fighting against user research, if you've got them, if you can get them to sit through some of the sessions, if you can get them, you know, to go and actually do well-designed user research sessions with 
somebody, you know, with a moderator who knows what they're doing. If they're not idiots, they're going to start to see the benefits of it. And if they are idiots, then you should get a job someplace else. I mean, that's, that's it. Like you can't, there, there are literally some environments where I don't think you'll ever get user research understood or adopted. And my only recommendation is go someplace that does it. I, I hate giving that advice. <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> Perfect, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, a few more questions here. And this one, this might be one, it's from McKenna for her to email you with, but I'll just throw it out there and you can let us know. Um, she says, my company has built a user persona by keeping a log of quotes from an online survey from our customers all over the world. This gives us lots of demographic and lifestyle info about them, but is this really sufficient? Where do we go from here? So a good way to test to see whether your persona is valid um, is to recruit some people based exactly on that persona. So what that means is like if you've got, you know, okay, they're 36 years old and they have two dogs and they drive a Subaru and, you know, they work in San Francisco or, you know, whatever, like you've got all of this demo, you've got all of these like facts about the people, right? Try to go out and try to recruit five people based on those, um, those facts, right? And then show them the product or talk to them about the product or talk to them about the problems that they might have that might lead them um, to need your product. And if you don't see very strong signal and very strong patterns and that everybody's like, yes, I feel exactly that the same way. Or if, you, if you're not really seeing that, you know, everybody has a need for your product, then you're, then you're, um, you need to fix your persona. Your persona is then it's too demographic and it's not behavioral enough. Um, because like I said, you really need to think about behaviors and attitudes when, when you're thinking about personas. Um, the reason that you have a persona is, is often twofold. It's so that, you know, you're always thinking about this, this, you know, canonical user when you're designing features and you can say like, well, you know, is that, the kind of thing that this person might like. But like I said, if it's too broad, then that's not going to help, right? If you're just making it for brunette women, that's just, that's not going to help. You're not going to be able to, you know, build a feature that, you know, applies to, or that, you know, that applies to 90% of brunette women. Um, the other reason that you have a persona is so that when you do research, you know that you're talking to the right kind of people and that you're getting the right feedback. So do that, right? Take your persona, turn it into user research, see what happens. If you're not getting patterns, your persona is bad. Um, and of course, at that point, you know, you need to continue to iterate on that until you found one that, that really makes sense. Thank you very much. Uh, next question here is from John. And John asks, Laura, I'm assuming all of this presentation is in your book. How much more is in your book than you, that you did not cover today? Um, actually, not all of this in its exact form is in the book. Um, there's stuff like this is sort of scattered throughout the book. Um, the first third of my book uh, talks about user research in general and um, dives more deeply into things like customer development and gives you more um, tactics and things. So this information is sort of in the first third of my book. The first third of my book also has more user research information. Um, the second third of my book actually talks about design and prototyping and all the, you know, sort of like, okay, once you've learned about problems and all that sort of thing, like here's, you know, how to design and test. And then the, the last part is more about um, testing and, and general, like how to fit UX into lean. So um, in my opinion, there's lots more <laughs> in my book than just this. Um, so hopefully, you know, check it out. Yay, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Next question from Daniel. Uh, he says, you used a lot of registration and e-commerce related examples. I'm wondering if user research is different for figuring out social networking behaviors. Yeah, so social networking actually is a little bit different. Um, the, so the e-commerce and the registration and all that, um, that that's, there are things that it has very much in common. Um, the, problem, not the problem, the tricky thing about social networking is, of course, you know, that you've got two people 
um, involved with it. So you just have to come up with strategies to get around that. The basics of it are really the same, right? Like you're still going to do contextual inquiry. You're still going to do observational testing. You're still going to watch people using your product. You're still going to do some, you, you know, you still want to do usability testing to make sure that people can find things or understand where things are. Um, in those cases, so for example, um, one that I did actually, um, I, you know, I worked at, at MVU, IMVU with Eric Ries, um, which is an avatar chat program. So it's, it's very much a social network. And I did a ton of user research in that sort of social environment. Um, you can still do all of these things. One thing that you may need to do if you're testing certain parts of your product, for example, if you're actually testing, um, if you're actually testing how people interact with, you know, their friends, you're going to have to observe them using their own data. It's much harder to sort of fake the data in usability testing. So, you know, for example, if it's a chat program, you actually have to have somebody for them to chat with. And there are lots of ways that, that you can fake that. Like I said, the basic principles are still the same. You're still talking to people, you're still um, developing personas, you're still, you know, asking the what and the why questions and figuring out if you're talking to your users or, or you know, if you're, if you're learning about your users or about your product. Um, there are a few little details that, that you need to, to work with when you've, got a, when, you, when you've got just basically more than one person. Same thing with, you know, like a marketplace. Um, so if you have specific questions about your specific products, feel free to email me and I'm, I'm happy to talk through them with you. Excellent. A couple more questions here, folks. Really good questions coming in, so thank you. We'll take just a few more, as many as we have time for here. Uh, Merlin asks, Laura, do these methodologies also work for business enterprises where they are not the end user of your product? How do you go about doing user research for business enterprises? Hmm. Oh, yes, business enterprises. Um, so what you're talking about, actually, is that you've got two personas built in. You have two natural personas. You have the customer and you have the user. And that's really important <laughs> because and I've done stuff with big businesses and what tends to happen is that um, they spend a lot of time talking to the customer and not much time talking to the user because of course the customer is the guy writing the check, right? So um, all of these same methodologies work really well with both the customer, the person writing the check and the user, you know, the end user. So it might be, you know, you've got, you know, the CIO might be your customer and, you know, the CIO is the person who's actually going to like, you know, evaluate your software and decide that it needs to, to you know, be built. Um, you might have another, um, another persona even, which is, you know, like the implementer, like the person who's going to then, you know, be in charge of actually installing the thing and making sure that it runs, you know, the administrator. And then, you know, you've got your end user who might be somebody who's like, you know, in a call center or whatever and is, and is using the product. So the important thing here is that you need to split up your research methodology appropriately. So you're not going to do usability testing on the CIO, right? Because he's probably not going to be using your product. But you might do usability, well, you definitely should be doing usability testing on the call center employees because they're the ones who actually have to, you know, live with his decision. <laughs> um, you're going to be doing customer development uh, interviewing on the CIO, and you're going to be doing contextual inquiry, understanding actually how people do their jobs, how these, you know, on um, probably a little bit both the CIO and also on the call center employees. So in other words, you want to understand what problems the call center employees are having in general. You want to know what environment they're working in. You want to know, you know, are they in a big room together? You know, can they hear each other? Can all, all these little, you know, what, how many questions are they expected to answer an hour? All of these questions are really important for you to understand. So you need to do um, research on, on them, but you also need to do research on, you know, the CIO. What's going to motivate him or her to, to you know, to, to make this purchase? What, what's the value proposition of your software? What can you promise them you are going to do for, you know, his users or for, for his employees? Um, how are you going to make him look good? Um, but like I said, you don't need to do usability testing on, on the CIO because the CIO will never open your product, almost certainly. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. You, all these methodologies still work. You just sort of have to split them up and do them on multiple personas at the same time. Thank you. A couple more questions here, folks. Um, Scott would like to know, Laura, can you give an overview of how you conduct focus groups? Oh, I can very easily do that. I don't. I, I refuse to conduct focus groups. Um, focus groups 
are a great way of spending the time and money to recruit 12 people and getting one opinion. Um, it's, I, I have never seen one give better results than doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with 12 different people. So if I had to choose, I would always just talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Um, Sheila would like to know, what type of professional researcher were you talking about when you said this webcast was not for you? I'm a former professional pharmaceutical researcher transitioning to user experience research. These tips were helpful for me. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, uh, yeah, so the types of user researchers that I'm talking about are specifically sort of um, user researchers who have, you know, most, most of the user researchers, you know, like me, um, because I've, I've worked as a user researcher um, as well as an interaction designer. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of know all these. We, we know about personas. We know about, um, you know, contextual inquiry and, and observational testing and, and all of those kinds of things. And, you know, we have our own methods for, um, for uh, analyzing data. Um, but no, you're, you're perfectly right. Professional researchers, um, you know, who are professional researchers from other environments, we have a, you know, we have a lot of jargon um, that, you know, we're, we're very good at and we throw around a lot and that, you know, we sort of know and we expect everybody to know and, and uh, know that it's probably these sorts of tips might, ho or hopefully, I'm, I'm glad that they were useful to, to you and I, I hope that they're helpful in helping you make that transition. Um, but uh, yeah, I should definitely make that that distinction because uh, user research is um, is not exclusive to my type of user research. Lots of people are doing research. I mean, really, you know, a lot of this is just the scientific method. I mean, you know, I talk about ethnography, you know, it's funny, you talk to some people who are doing, you know, UX research and they're talking about ethnography like they made it up. And I'm like, no, actually, you know, we've had anthropology for like a really long time. <laughs> that's That's been a thing, that's a science. People have studied that. Um, and so the more of, you know, other types of research that you can study and you can understand. You can bring all of that information to bear when you are, you know, talking to potential users. It's fantastic to, to bring in things from, from other disciplines. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Next question is from Christine. How do you develop behavioral screening characteristics versus demographic ones? Hmm. Oh, everybody's asking all the hard questions. <laughs> Yeah, this one's actually really sort of art. I mean, I'm sure that there's some science to it. Um, I would recommend that if you have a specific question about a specific market, that you send me an email and we can talk through it. But I don't really have a great um, model or explaining how to do that in all cases. Um, here's what I will say. Um, try to only include details that, that would matter to your product. And I, I know that that sounds sort of obvious but, um, and, and sort of simple, but it's, it's actually a lot of people don't do that. You know, they start to, to go into this like, well, you know, they, you know, they, like I said, you know, they, they have kids or they have pets or what. And I'm like, well, Unless your product is about kids or pets, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, you know, I was talking about before, you know, that, that your persona might be a CIO, you know, for your customer. But it's not just a CIO, right? It's, um, it's a CIO who is in charge of a call center. And it's a CIO who is in charge of a call center, maybe with, you know, at this point it might be demographic, you know, maybe with a certain number of employees. And the certain number of employees might matter to this particular type of product, because you know maybe your product really is about making large groups of employees more productive, or maybe you know the persona is it's a CIO with a large number of call center employees who have a lot of turnover. Because maybe your product is something that reduces turnover in call center employees. So of course you don't want to talk to CIOs who have a lot of call center employees but have zero turnover. They're perfectly happy. Your product is, is absolutely not targeted at that person. So you really have to, every single thing that you add to a persona, you really have to ask yourself, is this, am I putting this in there just because like I met somebody who was like this, or am I putting this in there because it's pertinent to my product? That's the best I can do on that particular question. Like I said, if you have specifics, please email me. I'm happy to 
to, you know, think through with you. Perfect. Two more questions. Uh, Mike would like to know, Laura, what critical tasks, input docs, or information or steps should a company or lean startup have covered before they start thinking through UX? Nothing. <laughs> um, UX is always first. Uh, no. So I actually, um, I, I have this very broad sweeping definition. Somebody once said that the thing that UX designers love more than anything else in the world is defining what UX is or redefining what UX is. Um, so I'm going to do that. Um, UX is, I mean, it's the user experience, right? It's the product. It's figuring out who your user is and, and what they're like and what problems they have that you can solve and, and uh, um, all of these things, right? And so if you think about this user research and this customer development, I mean, I think of that as part of UX. Um, what a lot of people mean when they ask that question, and maybe you don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what a lot of people mean there is that they think, I mean, UI, which is the user interaction, which is like really how users perform specific tasks. That comes later. That comes after you've really understood your user, you've understood what problem um, you're solving for them, um, you, you've understood like how you're going to change their lives, you've understood like what the flows are and you know what features and um, what features go into making a, a product that you know could actually solve a problem for somebody. At that point, you start to think about you know the the actual user interface. The the you know if the, if there's a screen, you, know, you start thinking about the screen. If there are buttons, you start thinking about the buttons. You start thinking about the input methods and the the actual the interface between the human and the product. Um, but uh, for UX. UX is the whole thing, baby. That's the that's product. That's thinking about that's your user and what they do and what their problems are and how you're gonna make their lives better. So um, nothing comes before UX. A lot of stuff comes before UI, though. And we'll finish up today with this final question, Laura from Ari. Can you talk a little bit about how to go about qualitative and ethnographic research in a lean way? <laughs> I can talk a lot about that. Um, <laughs> but there is something in the book. Um, honestly, the leanest thing about um, the kind of research that, that I'm recommending, like I said, qual you know, ethnographic and, and qualitative research is, is well understood. It's not specifically lean. Um, the way that I like to make it, I'm not going to say leaner because um, this isn't particularly lean, but I, I, the way that I like to make it sort of faster and, and more applicable to, to lean startups is, um, like I said, really nail your persona first and then talk to people in small iterative batches. Small iterative batches is, is actually a very lean thing. Um, don't go talk to 100 people. Go talk to five people and then process that information and then figure out what five people you want to talk to next and then keep doing that. It's not that you're only going to talk to five people. It's that you're only going to talk to, you know, three to five people at a time. Um, if you do this iteratively, it's going to actually help you process the information much faster. You're not going to end up with this like giant dump of data at the end that you have to sort through. Um, you're going to help, you know, you're going to help narrow down on your persona faster. I mean, it's just going to help you sort of process that information better. Um, you're not doing, I mean, I, I always kind of laugh and I say that ethnographic research is like, you know, just go watch gorillas in the mist. Um, but it's not going out and doing this enormous, you know, six months or a year of, you know, just learning everything about about your user. It's it's very it's much more targeted when you're doing it in this lean way. Um, you're trying to learn about um, your user, but you're trying to learn about your user in a very specific context. You're trying to learn about the pro about their problems, but not all of their problems. You don't care about the problems in their marriage. You don't care about the problems with their kids or their car or whatever. I mean, unless that's what your startup's about. You care about their problems as they relate to your product. So just be specific. Um, get the right people and then iterate, iterate, iterate. That's always the, always the leanest thing I can ever tell you to do. Perfect. And with that, folks, we are going to say a very big thank you to you, Laura, for spending time with us today and for sharing all your knowledge and expertise with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Folks that attended our event today, we thank you for attending the webcast and hope you've benefited from it. And for those of you that sent in your questions, thank you so much for those because having your questions really adds just so much more to our event, so we do appreciate it. We'd also like to let you know that we did push out a discount code to you all in your group chat. So if you haven't opened that group chat, please open it before you exit. Discount code in there to save you some money on Laura's book today. If you like what you heard and what Laura's been talking to you about, 
we invite you to take advantage of that discount to get the book. Lots more in there that can really help you with your day-to-day. Also, mark your calendars for October 18th. Laura is going to be live with Eric Reese on a webcast, and they are going to talk a lot about lean user research and lean startup tips and techniques. So please bring your questions. We pushed out a link to that as well. Again, it's going to be on October 18th. You don't want to miss it. Laura, thank you so much. Folks that attended, we thank you. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody.